come free us from a thousand years of darkness, a millennium of solitude and suffering, beautiful white wings for you, for the world, death, and destruction. <laughs> Someday you will know who you really are. The sun was setting on the fourth year of the new millennium, December 2003. The Nintendo GameCube is two years into its lifespan, and it's struggling to achieve the level of success pop culture might suggest it had decades later. The PlayStation 2 is in its third year and shaping up to be an unprecedented success. Microsoft was working wonders to show that a new console manufacturer can indeed garner appeal in the market with the Xbox and its revolutionary Halo series. Meanwhile, Sega had already left the console market, having sailed their swan, the Sega Dreamcast, over the horizon, singing a somber tune and consigning themselves to a life of strictly third-party development. During this era, public interest in games was starting to shift. Turn-based RPGs were becoming a fad of the past. First-person shooters were on the rise with the controls finally reaching what would be considered the norm for the genre. 3D action games were getting slicker than ever, and classic survival horrors were on the way out, barring a few remakes and a couple uniquely successful games. Games such as Silent Hill 2 or 3. A lot of slower-paced input light genres of yesteryear were starting to make a change to more action-oriented gameplay, evidenced in the success of later release games such as Resident Evil 4 or Kingdom Hearts 2. However, slower, more contemplative experiences wouldn't or rather couldn't be erased entirely. And it's one game from one developer, a developer who was intent on keeping the classic turn-based RPG alive while experimenting immensely within the genre, that I would like to talk about today. That game is Baton Kaido's Eternal Wings and the Lost Ocean, and that developer is none other than the well-respected powerhouse known as Monolith Soft. Only Monolith Soft wasn't always some well-known studio. Prior to the release of Xenoblade Chronicles on the Wii, the franchising of the series and numerous re-releases, Monolith had a lot of trouble getting their foot in the door. Which is a shame to say, as I love Monolith the way old people love buying clutter that they call knickknacks. I just think they're neat. But as it was, Monolith Soft was a pretty new developer at this time and would have a long ways to go to get the recognition they deserved. What with the company only just getting its start in 1999. But before we get into the video, hello and welcome to Tark's Gauntlet. I'm Tark's. These are my gauntlets. That's my intro now, and I guess I'm just gonna stick with it. Today's episode is brought to you by me. Well, me and my buddy Galeria, who you might remember from the Tales of Arise video. Gil? Oh, hey, what's up? Oh, wait, why am I the bouncer? That is to say, in the time between my last couple big uploads, he and I mostly him, put together a video on one of the PlayStation 1's oddest titles. The Japanese-only, fan-translated Mizerna Falls. A Twin Peaks-esque mystery game set in one of console video games' first attempts at an open world. It's a weird title to say the least, but it's an amazing time capsule of ambition run headfirst into the wall of system limitations. So when you're wrapping up here, swing on over to his channel and give the video a check. There's a link in the description below to that video, as well as channels from everybody else who helped on this video. And if you like either video, by all means, you guys know the deal. Like, comment, and subscribe. I do have a coffee account if you're feeling extra generous, but otherwise, sit back, get comfy, and enjoy this long look back at Baton Kaido's Eternal Wings and the Lost Ocean. Monolith Soft, like many studios of the era, was born out of frustration. Tetsuya Takahashi, the studio's founding member and most prominent game director, got his start in the industry in the 1980s, working on games for Nihon Falcom. Most notably was the first of the Legend of Heroes titles known then as Dragon Slayer VI, The Legend of Heroes. Following this, he gained employment with the more prominent Squaresoft, known now as Square Enix, following a merger in the 2000s. While there, he worked on some of Square's biggest titles such as Chrono Trigger and a few of their flagship Final Fantasy games. It wasn't too much later that he was put into a director's role to spearhead a game of his own creation. That game being... 
Xenogears. Xenogears, being made primarily by a team of industry juniors, would face a lot of trouble during development. As they reached the halfway point of production, budget and time were running out, and Squaresoft was putting pressure on the team to just let the game end where Disc 1 completes. Feeling this was too sudden and not a good place to plan a sequel from, and without being able to secure more money or time to see their vision through to the end, they utilized the rest of their dev time to condense the missing parts of the story in the style of a visual novel, opting to only make the most important moments play it wasn't ideal, but it was the best they could come up with, with the support they received from Squaresoft. When the game released, it wasn't quite the smash success Square wanted it to be. But then, outside of Final Fantasy, nothing ever seems to live up to their expectations anyway. So when the time came for Takahashi to start developing Xenogears 2, Square put their foot down and refused to fund the project. At this roadblock, Takahashi packed his things and took a few key employees with him to start his own company, Monolith Soft, where he intended to develop Xenogears 2 on his own. Only things didn't quite work out that well. Unfortunately, Square refused to allow him to use the license, so Takahashi would do the next best thing he could think of. He started a spiritual successor series, Xenosaga, which more or less continued the plot lines he had planned for the Xeno series, without incorporating anything too directly that would get him sued. The Xeno series lives on stronger than ever now through the Xenoblade series, but while the Xenosaga series was still being developed, Monolith wanted to invest in a new team, in new unrelated projects with different and fresher ideas. Of course, this new game or this new IP would be called Batten Kaido's Eternal Wings and the Lost Ocean. These fresh ideas would be sourced from Monolith's younger staff who comprised most of the team. They also utilized a team of developers from their partner studio, Tri Crescendo, a studio who formerly only worked on sound and music for games. But in this one instance, they would tackle the battle system as well as the sound design. As the new game went into development, they scouted which platforms they would like to release their game on, and settled exclusively on the Nintendo GameCube, feeling the system had little real RPG presence and that their game would garner more notice releasing there. Sales, unfortunately, would not prove this to be the case, but they were at least good enough to greenlight a second entry in the series, Batten Kaido's Origins, which we won't be getting into today, and also I've never played it. With a title like Batten Kaido's, it was no shock it had a hard time drawing people in. Most people don't know what a Batten Kaido's is, and even after extensive research, most of us still struggle to even learn how it's supposed to be pronounced. So before we get into the real meat and potatoes of the video, I'd like to segue into a new segment called How the Frank Do You Pronounce This Word? How the Frank Do You Pronounce This Word? Batten Kaido's, Batten Kaido's, Batten Kaido's. Okay. In my defense, that Nintendo Direct didn't exist when I put together the next part of this video. So we're gonna go ahead with this regardless. Besides, it may shock some of you to learn that that Nintendo Direct didn't exactly prove how this word is supposed to be pronounced, but rather just showed us how the developers decided they would be pronouncing it. So let's go ahead and take a look on why this 20 year debate on how a word is supposed to be pronounced never actually reached a definitive conclusion. The title Batten Kaidos is derived from a star of the same name, Batten Kaidos Zeta Seti, a double star at the center of the constellation Satis. At least I think I'm pronouncing that right. Actually, I don't think I'm pronouncing that right. I'm pretty sure I'm probably pronouncing it wrong. This constellation appears in the shape of a whale, or by some interpretations, a mythical sea beast, with the Batten Kaidos star marking the creature's belly. Other stars within this constellation, such as the star of Mira, make appearances in the game as well as locations, and the story this constellation tells is utilized as part of the game's world lore. The thing is, the name of this star is Arabic in nature and loosely translates to belly of the sea monster. And as far as I can tell, the Arabic pronunciation is more along the lines of Batten Kaitos, and the spelling was also a tad bit different, most notably with Kaitos beginning with a Q. Batten Kaitos. Since the game was released from a Japanese company, however, and most people don't know better, the general public opts for a more Japanese interpretation, calling it Kaitos instead of Kaitos, which I will be doing today. That said, many other pronunciation attempts exist, and I won't jump to call any of them wrong. People have gone to great lengths to prove definitively one way or another how the game was meant to be pronounced. Batten Kaidos, Batten Kaidos, Batten Kaidos. And if you've never seen it, I highly recommend you check out JRPG's video on the matter. If not for the destination, at least for the journey, as he attempts to retrieve audio recordings from the game's legacy English website, wherein the English voice actors were rumored to be heard pronouncing the title. I will, however, cast doubt on such a thing being definitive proof. Given the English voice actors had anything but consistent voice 
voice direction, often pronouncing the names of in-game locations and characters different from one another. For example, Malpercio is sometimes pronounced Malpercio. Malpercio's minions could come attack at any time. The cursed power of Malpercio. Wazen is sometimes pronounced Wazen. Wazen really exists. Wazen, the Ice Man. Anue Anue is sometimes pronounced Anu Anua, and so on. It's very likely the actors just had to make up pronunciations as they went along, and I can't comfortably call them a reliable source. And as one last piece of evidence, one more thing for consideration, a member of my research table on Discord, the legendary Zoltan, also known as Turn-Based Memories here on YouTube, link in the description, took it upon himself following a discussion to reach out to astrophysicists and the International Astronomical Union in search of answers whose findings were also inconclusive at best. The former stated that most stars are only ever referred to by a catalog number rather than a given name, and though names are recognized formally by the IAU, no pronunciation is ever specifically prescribed, and that Baton Kaido specifically was Arabic in nature, then transcribed to Latin, and finally English. They did however state that the original pronunciation would be Baton Cadus. The IAU merely referenced a Wikipedia pronunciation and attempted to spell it out phonetically using other words as an example, implying Baton Katos was accurate. So all this is to say that there is no official way to say Baton Kaidos in reference to the thing the game's title is based on. The developers have settled on how they would like to say it, but honestly, it's a choice based on comfort and little else. So if you say it a different way and other people still understand what you're talking about, that should be all that matters. So I would say to you all, don't sweat the pronunciation. None of the experts ever did. And if anybody wants to correct how other people say it, well, they know where they can stick. So let's just say here that your interpretation, whatever it is, is valid and put that whole thing aside. After two games, Baton Kaidos was laid to rest and Monolith would begin their next journey in the world of Xenoblade Chronicles. And the rest, as they say, is history. So let's take a look at this outstanding gem of their past that, stuck for decades as a GameCube exclusive, almost got lost to time. Let's start our proper look at this game by looking at its story. The story begins, more or less, with our main character Callus awaking in a doctor's house in a small village named Sebelrai on the continent of Sadal Sud, another location named after a star, this time the brightest star in the constellation of Aquarius. Callus was brought to the doctor's house after being found unconscious in the nearby Moongile Forest, an area the locals know well to be cautious around. It was there he sustained an injury that seemed to have given him and the player named Guardian Spirit that resides within and around him a sort of of short-term memory loss. Before this brief setback, Callus had been on a journey to get revenge for the murder of his grandfather and brother, and he's pretty set on returning to that task, which he does shortly after meeting up with a young, mysterious traveler named Shella. Shella, like Callus, experienced an attack close by, which claimed the lives of her two traveling companions. And it's upon recovering their bodies we see just how true to his name our main character Callus really is. My oh my, look at what we have here. A load of fresh Magnus. These could come in handy. Hey, you're stealing their things? They're my friends, you know. They were your friends. These won't be doing them much good now. We gotta do what we can to survive, right? After all, I don't hear them complain. Though Callus' logic can't be argued with, his cold nature is a shock to say the least, and moments like this one cement him as one of the biggest asshole main characters I've ever seen in a JRPG. But that's something I'm completely on board with. That said, his cruel spirit isn't just a product of his nature. Callus is somewhat of a sympathetic asshole, having gone his whole life feeling ostracized and singled out for his having been born with only one wing. In place of the second wing is a mechanical device of his grandfather's making. The recovering of Shella's deceased traveling companions also gives us one of our first real glimpses into the cultures we can find throughout the world of Baton Kaidos, as Shella gives a ceremonial prayer over their bodies. Cast light upon the darkened earth. Save those lost in despair. O mighty ocean, guide us as we journey through the darkest pit of night. The cat 
As Callus and Shella venture back through Moongaya Forest, they come across a great beast, which in felling, they stumble into the main crux of the plot. As the creature falls, a powerful card known as an End Magnus appears in his place, only to be confiscated quickly after by members of the Alfard Empire. Now, I'm sure that's a lot of unprompted jargon, so at this point, let's take a minute to unpack some of these terms for those who aren't familiar with the game. The Alfard Empire are one of the world's dominating powers, hailing from the continent of the same name. They are easily one of the world's most aggressive superpowers, seeking to impose their will over others, and also believing an innate superiority exists within them. It's worth noting at this point as well that the continents, such as Alfard, are floating landmasses in the sky that exist above a layer of poisonous cloud. The world isn't in this shape through any natural means. Generations back, a god threatened the world that drove humanity to the brink of extinction with mankind only escaping their demise because a select few powerful individuals were able to separate the god's power into five different artifacts and seal it away. Seal but not destroy. The damage this god created before being sealed, however, made the world uninhabitable for the average person. And to ensure a future for mankind, those ancient powers that sealed the demonic creature used their abilities to raise massive chunks of land above the tainted clouds and suspend them there indefinitely. This life in the sky would cause a gradual evolution for humanity as well, bringing about the development of their wings. Now for the end Magnus I mentioned. In short, a Magnus is essentially a card which traps the essence of a physical item for easy use and transportation. However, it does not trap things in a permanent form. Magnus tends to degrade over time, and the essence trapped within them have the potential to change form. Flames burn out, food rots, milk sours, etc. The end Magnus specifically are five Magnus cards that sealed away the god's power. Malpercio's power, which ended his reign of terror many generations ago. So the question remains then, why was the Alfard Empire around when this End Magnus was revealed to Shella and Callus, and what do they intend to do by taking it? Whatever the case, the solution should be obvious, right? <laughs> Although, I guess in fairness, Malpercio's power within the Magnus is still too powerful to be destroyed in this manner. Of course, the plot develops from here, but the through point remains the same until a certain pivotal moment we'll discuss later. For now, all you need to know is that Shella and Callus continue Callus's quest for vengeance, and a new quest to uncover the five pieces of the End Magnus and try to prevent the cards from falling into the hands of the Alfard Empire. Next, let's take a brief look at our characters and something unique the game does in terms of its player perspective. Like most JRPGs, the party grows as the plot progresses, and Bat and Kaidos plays host to a magnificent cast of characters. But before we look at our party, I want to showcase a special character who at no point in this footage will you ever see. That spirit seems to like you. This character does not have a physical form, and their involvement in the story grants Bat and Kaidos a sort of narrative perspective I don't think I've ever seen in another RPG. Before the main plot takes off, the game itself opens with a series of flashbacks. At the moment, the most important of which is one showcasing our main character Callus forming a pact with a guardian spirit whom the player gets to name themselves. I, of course, named mine Tark. Though I mentioned Callus as the main character, and we do control him as we make our way through the world, it might be more accurate to say that the guardian spirit, though they're never seen nor properly heard, is actually the main character of the game, and it's absolutely brilliant how they handled their incorporation. It is not through Callus's eyes we perceive the events of the story, but through the eyes of the guardian spirit. When Callus or other members of the party interact with the guardian spirit, they turn to face the camera to do so. And in doing this, that familiar act of breaking the fourth wall is flipped on its head, and a really strong sense of immersion is established. The fixed camera angles in the game no longer feel like just fixed camera angles. They're the guardian spirit and the player's first-person 
perspective into the world. The characters aren't looking at the camera when they talk to the guardian spirit, they look through it in a sense. They look at you, the player. And when they speak and ask questions to the guardian spirit, it is you as the player who chooses how to answer them. Bang Kaidos does an incredible job of incorporating the player into the world through a few simple tricks that radically alter the story and player perspective without disrupting the rules of the universe to do so or incorporating weird gimmicks. The player and the spirit are essentially one and the same, an observer and participant controlling the inside from the outside, acknowledged but never seen nor heard. Otherwise, the cast of characters is your usual band of rabble, but well executed with excellent chemistry and fantastic designs courtesy of lead character designer, Nakaba Higurashi. As far as I know, not related to the visual novel or anime of the same name. If you like their work, I've provided a link in the description below to their personal website so you can explore their portfolio at your leisure. They truly have some spectacular work. As for the characters themselves, to start, we have our rough and tumble giant Gibari, a fisherman with a burning desire to do well in the eyes of the world and improve things for his friends and family. Both his mouth and heart are larger than his brain, but love and muscles pulls him through more often than not. Next, we have Liud. Liud is an ex Alfardian noble caught at the crossroads between his commitment to his family and the empire or his commitment to what he believes in his heart to be right and just. His former commitment being more convenient and inherently rewarding in a superficial sense, with the latter being more psychologically rewarding but rife with inherent sacrifice and pain. Savina is a little more mysterious in nature, but not the most mysterious of the party. She's an incredibly skilled fighter and has a history as a mercenary. Her name and reputation often precedes her and is usually accompanied by sudden shock and fear, and for good reason though that reason is not something I'll be spoiling here today. It's not a huge deal to the game overall, but it is a really good backstory that makes Savina a very compelling character. By far the most mysterious character, however, is a weird little masked creature, probably human, though when you first meet them you have no way of knowing, named Mizuti, or rather, the Great Mizuti. Mizuti is kind of defined by their mysterious nature. The more they talk, the more questions you have, but those questions do have rewarding answers that the party will uncover eventually. Mizuti is initially found just sort of wandering in what essentially amounts to blank space, just cruising by like a peaceful ferryman when the party needs help the most. They talk about themselves as if they're the main character in the story, and often in third person. The hero, the protagonist, the chosen one, the Great Mizuti. And usually, it's just in the party's best interest to accept Mizuti at face value and take the immense help this powerful denizen provides. Shella we mentioned briefly earlier, and while she doesn't always appear the most mysterious character, she is concealing her own plot driving secrets. But otherwise, all that really needs to be known is that she's mostly just the polite, soft, serene character. The picture of purity in the most traditional sense, right down to her soft features and angelic blonde hair. The perfect counterpart to Callus's acidic personality. When it comes to the antagonist, Bang Kaidos is a little worse off, but not in any way that really drags the game down. Most of the antagonists are made up of different members and ranks of people in the Alfardian Empire, some of which have ties to Kallus' past, with others possibly just seeking power by way of the end Magnus. But then we also have the occasional named goon-type antagonists, who feel like they're just there to pump up the enemy forces, make interesting battles, and give an air of cool to the people you fight. While even these characters get to develop some and have a bigger place in the plot, the majority of their stay within it just feels like filling space. Unfortunately, since the big bad is part of a big game reveal, I can't discuss them much yet in this section of the video, but I will say some of the voiceover work maybe betrays their twist reveal. Not that it's any less impactful when you get to it. And while their backstory isn't one I felt left a huge impression on me, not saying anything bad against it, they are certainly an effective and intimidating big bad regardless. There's a certain degree of unstableness to the character. That chaotic evil energy that goes down like a good bourbon. Smooth, but best served in moderation. I don't want a dick in Were my feet in that shot? No. Foot <laughs> <laughs> Give me a weird comment. 
So even where the villains don't fill the biggest shoes, the characters, their hidden backstories, the world and its political interconnectedness, Callus' quest for vengeance and the looming threat of the end Magnus all gives the story a sense of urgency and a wonderful stage for the game's tragedies to unfold on. Speaking broadly, identity is about the biggest theme we come across in the world of Batankaidos. Whether it be characters learning about themselves by dealing with their own moral and ethical dilemmas, or characters just coping with how the world around them reacts to who they already know they are, they're all looking for a way to fit in and fulfill the obligations they hold to themselves. Though, like any world, it's a hostile environment to develop or self-reflect within. With all the political strife in play, many of the characters are put under intense pressure to behave unethically, and this dilemma at times will result in the bloodshed or killing of innocent people. Whether directly responsible or not, it's actionable to our main cast and anchors heavy to their personalities and their character development. Without spoiling anything, Baton Kaidos deals with grief and suffering more than your average game, and the subject matter at times gets very mature. Nothing is ever dwelt on too long or over-examined to the point it feels preachy. If anything, it tends to move on from the big issues quickly without clearly saying anything too grand about them. Though this also isn't really a bad thing. We as players witness the tragedy and suffer with the characters long enough to understand their development and how they're affected, but we don't take the time to exactly wallow in the misery. Statements could be found and understood by those who are looking for them, but Bat and Kaidos will certainly not beat you over the head with it. Though the tragedy and suffering may come up often for our main cast, it is used with grace and propriety. And now we arrive at the complicated part. Combat in Baton Kaido's Eternal Wings and the Lost Ocean remains unique still today. And though it's an incredibly simple system built around only a few ideas, it will sound, as I explain it to you, rather convoluted. And while it's true it will require some micromanaging as you go along, it really is anything but convoluted. So let's start at the basics. The entirety of combat is based around the Magnus cards we discussed earlier. These come in many different forms, from attack and defense cards with or without different elements, physical or magical in form and with different weapon types. Some cards are restorative in nature or provide buffs and protections from certain status effects, where others may only serve to give your attack a damage boost without dealing damage on its own. So before you enter battle, you'll have to build your Magnus deck. This is similar in many ways to building a deck for, say, Magic the Gathering. However, each character plays with a different deck and certain weapon type cards can only be used by specific characters. For instance, any attack card where the pictured weapon is a paddle obviously goes to Gabari, the fisherman. Callus cannot attack with an aura, even in Magnus form. Your deck size is pretty small at the start of the game, but it can be increased as you progress via character-specific items hidden throughout the world. If you don't fill your entire deck, the blank spaces are filled with blank cards, which can serve a purpose in combat, but not enough of a purpose to not just put a card there instead. Even a low level card is a greater benefit. Now when battle starts on your character's turn, your deck is randomized and a handful of cards are drawn from it at the start of the encounter for you to choose from. The size of your hand and how many cards you can play on your turn also increases as you progress. However, the time you have to choose what cards you're going to play also goes down. During attack phases, you have the option to pick between attack cards, finishers, cameras, consumables, and buffs. If you choose a defense card on this turn that has no attack capabilities, the card is simply removed from your hand. If you're using a consumable card and targeting yourself or your allies, some consumables may cause damage, but there's very rarely a reason to use them. More than anything, it just punishes you for not paying attention. Similarly, you can also use your curative cards against enemies and heal them in the middle of your combos. Bat and Kaidos does not have much in the way of defending you from making bad decisions. But how you would normally handle an attack phase is pretty simple. You just choose the cards that deal the most damage in ways that will allow you to maximize your damage output. And if you're lucky, the last card you can play will be a finisher. Finishers being character-specific attack cards that can only be played after using other attack cards. Finishers end combo chains regardless of where you use them, so it's best to get as far into your combo as you can before using one. When performing your combos, however, there's quite a few things to consider. So we'll start with a pretty simple one, the element types. Element weaknesses work in pairs. If you you attack an enemy whose native element is fire with a fire-based attack, then the damage will move right through them and your card would be wasted. Actually, worse than wasting it, it amplifies the enemy's attacks against you. If the Magnus, however, deals fire and physical damage, 
then the physical damage will still be added to your total and only the fire damage will be zeroed out. Damage, however, is not calculated linearly. Every card you play in the run of a combo is calculated at once at the end of the turn. This means if you attack with fire damage and water damage on one combo chain, even if there's other attacks between them, then the fire and water damage will cancel each other out point for point. The remainder between the two will be added to your total, which will then be stacked up against the enemy's played defense magnus to be negated once again. For a brief example, still keeping it simple, let's say you played five cards with the following stats. One card that does 20 fire damage, another that does 10 fire damage, a third that does 35 water damage, a fourth that does 15 light damage, and a fifth that does 55 physical damage. Between these five cards, there is a total of 135 damage points. The fire damages combine for a total of 30, but then are canceled out by your water damage cards, leaving you with zero fire damage and five water damage. The 15 light damage and 55 physical will proceed through to the enemy's defense magnus. Now let's say the enemy played five defense cards with the following stats. One for 15 fire defense, another for 10 water defense, a third for 15 dark defense, a fourth for five wind defense, and a fifth for 25 physical defense. After calculating the enemy's defense cards, your five remaining water damage is canceled by the five remaining fire defense. The 15 dark defense cancels out the 15 light damage. The five wind defense has nothing to defend against, so it's dropped and the 25 physical defense cancels 25 from your physical attack. What started as 135 damage points on your cards is now only worth 30 points of damage. So as you can see, element choice plays a very important role in your attacks. So too does this importance exist during defense phase when the enemy is attacking. It's worth noting here that though you can defend with some attack cards, defense cards cannot usually be used during attack phases. They can be discarded to bring new cards into your hand, but not attacked with. That is Side, element choice and damage numbers aren't the only thing to consider during a turn. You also have these numbers on the cards called spirit numbers. You'll notice these spirit numbers scattered to the quarters, and though many cards have multiple, only one spirit number per card is used when you play your card, a choice you have to make by tilting the C stick in the direction of the number you want to use. The idea behind these spirit numbers is to arrange them in ways befitting of poker hands, thus earning you percentile bonuses to your attack and defense totals. These are calculated at the very end of your chain. So basically, you're looking for pairs, three of a kind, and ascending and descending straights. Some of these types of hands can be mixed and matched, such as two different sets of pairs, or a pair and three of a kind. However, if there is one card in your play that doesn't fit a pattern, then any bonus you may have got is forfeit. As you get further into the game and your attack and defense sequences allow you to cast more cards, the bonuses you gain through the spirit number system start to become more important, so much so that it becomes a part of higher level strategy to gamble using clashing element types to earn bigger spirit card bonuses at the end. It can be entirely worth it late game to intentionally cancel a couple cards out and lower your damage output to continue a 7-9 to nine card straight, where the bonus will massively exceed the damage you lost. So though it looks complicated when you're looking at the damage stat screen and considering all the formulas being performed and the numbers being crunched, it really is quite straightforward. Try to avoid using clashing elements, target the enemy's weakness, and pursue poker hands with the card's spirit numbers. But you gotta do all this really quickly because the timer does not allow for slow methodical planning. Neither does the random nature of your card draws, which, if your deck is built a little uneven, may have you going several turns discarding card after card, hoping to get something you can defend yourself with. But that element of unpredictability is part of the charm of the game, and it's something they lean into quite heavily as well, with some cards not being able to be activated without another card being used first, or certain cards being used in secret orders that can cause another Magnus to transform into a new, super powerful attack that can't be accessed or used in any other way. But wait! So you remember earlier I mentioned deck building was something you really have to stay on top of, and also I mentioned something about Magnuses having decay rates? The decay rates of the Magnus add an interesting element of surprise for anybody not staying on top of their deck building, and they can affect your proficiency in battle in a lot of interesting ways. For a quick example of how this might work, let's say you have a flaming sword card for Callus. All things considered, a pretty good card, but after carrying it around long enough, the flame goes out and you're left with a normal 
Marvel Short Sword that might do less physical damage and no fire damage at all. Still useful in combat, but obviously not as useful. Similarly, you can use fruit as a curative in battle, but after a period of time, that fruit will become rotten fruit, changing it from a curative to an offensive item that can inflict poison, or inflict poison on your own people if you target them with it. So now would probably be a good time to mention this is not my first time playing Bat and Kaidos. I originally played this game when it was new-ish, probably a year old at that point. I likely got it used because I was poor, but I was a bit younger and less patient for certain things back then. At the time, I made it to the final boss of the game, but having missed some side content, I arrived woefully underleveled and all of my decks with all of my characters were absolutely atrocious. I swear my decks were loaded in a way that I draw rotten fruit on almost every hand and I just couldn't bring myself to fix it. I just didn't have the patience for it. So at the time, I abandoned my playthrough at the final boss, likely going on to do my 13th playthrough of Tales of Symphonia with 10 times EXP bonuses, level and arts carryovers, and grade bonuses, speedrunning the game and skipping all the cutscenes to finish it in a day. So yeah, part of my replay of Bat and Kaidos now has been driven by a desire for redemption, something I can proudly say I achieved. And as an adult, now twice the age of when I first played it, I can feel myself wanting to go back and give my younger self a piece of advice. If I could see 14 year old me now, I'd definitely tell him, my but getting back on Magnus Decay and Evolution though, some items that change over time are a little more sophisticated than just rotting away or losing their luster. One group of Magnus, for instance, might resemble something like a savings account for a bank. The Magnus only real purpose is to sell for cash, but if you build interest on it, you can sell it for a lot more. Pictures too need time to develop to be sold for their full rate. This decay and development system ensures an ongoing level of surprise as you adventure, but also keeps you going back to refresh your deck constantly. When combined with the random draw aspect of battle, it keeps combat evolving constantly. No two battles are the same. Whether due to random draws, how frequently you update your deck, or the price you pay for not updating it, new things are always happening and demanding your moment-to-moment -moment attention to react and strategize to accordingly. It is a brilliant system. But before we move on to the next chunk of this video, I'd like to back up a little bit more to the pictures I mentioned a moment ago, as these basically drive the economy in the world of Bat and Kaidos. In short, camera cards can be added to your deck to be used in battle. These allow you to take pictures of your enemies and allies, which you sell at local shops. The pictures serve as your most efficient way to make cash throughout your journey. Any other means is simply insufficient. The value of the pictures you sell is dictated by the rarity of the photograph subject, as well as the quality of the photo. Photo quality can be controlled by using higher level camera cards, but also by using light and dark elemental attacks to adjust the lighting in the environment before snapping a shot. Having said that, however, pictures are generally worth enough cash as is without putting too much focus on the lighting aspect. So it's always worth having at least one character with one camera card in their deck as you play. And that's especially true for completionists, as Bat and Kaidos also keeps a log of every type of Magnus you acquire, which includes one Magnus for every enemy type and player character. And there are a lot of Magnus, with the official count landing at 1,000, 22. And on that note, I think it's time we look at what Bat and Kaidos has to offer in terms of side content. And as you can probably guess, Magnus cards and their various mechanics play a huge role here, for better or worse. In true Monolith Soft fashion, Bat and Kaidos is loaded with side quests for players to do as they venture across the world. And in the fashion of the age this game came out in, a lot of it can be rather cryptic, cumbersome, unforgiving, and just downright unfriendly to the player. But that doesn't mean it isn't still fun to accept every quest and see what you can pull off along the way. Although with no real quest log, it will be up to you to keep track of it all. And not keeping track of it all can set you back a fair chunk. So let's start with the basics here. Most side quests are solved by the use of something called Quest Magnus. Quest Magnus are blank cards you use in the overworld to absorb the essence of objects, and they come in very short supply. These absorbed essences are then used to complete fetch quests or solve puzzles. For example, you might use the absorbed essence of fire to burn a log that's been blocking your path. When an essence is used, the quest Magnus reverts to being blank. Most side quests are found by talking to various NPCs throughout the world, and most just require you to have to find the right item for them. But some items cannot be naturally acquired. As an example, we'll look at two quests you can pick up side by side in the second town in the game. 
One is a request for yogurt, and the other a request for cheese. At this point in the game, however, these items cannot just be found. And to complete the quest as early as possible, you'll need to return to the first town and gather two essences of pow milk. After 30 minutes of carrying around a pow milk quest magnus, it will age into pow milk yogurt, thus allowing you to complete one of the two quests. If you carry the other pow milk yogurt around for another hour, you'll find it's aged into pow milk cheese, allowing you to complete the second quest. So it just dawned on me in the middle of editing this that uh, back in junior high when all my friends were playing Pokemon and evolving all their, their monsters and their creatures, I was playing Bat and Kaidos at home and <laughs> evolving milk into yogurt and cheese and evolving fruit into rotten fruit. I wouldn't change it. Completing this early can be tough, however, as your quest magnus is very limited, and you'll find a lot of things you might want to absorb for use later. It's hard to balance the things you know you need with what you know nothing about that you might need later. Further, some of the quest magnus slots get filled early on with side quest items that you might carry around for the entirety of the adventure. For instance, early on you take mementos from Shella's fallen comrades, and these can be returned to their waiting wives back home. However, it is well beyond the halfway point of the game before you come across Shella's hometown for the first time. And though you'll most likely be eagerly looking forward to getting rid of these items and freeing up some quest magnus, returning the mementos when you first arrive isn't exactly recommended, especially if you're attempting a completionist run, as after carrying these mementos around for a shocking 40 hours, they will evolve into another type of magnus which can only be acquired through this evolution. It's kind of absurd, really, but love it or hate it, Monolith Soft had the idea and by god they were going to see it through. The scary part it is though, this isn't even the most absurd card, but we'll discuss that a little more later. For now, let's look at another quest magnus that will hog space for the majority of the runtime. That is, if you choose to pursue the quest. This magnus is the Kutzman family tree chart. So early on, you come across a man fearing the end of his days drawing near. And naturally, he would like one last opportunity to see all the members of his family reunited before he departs. But Kutzman doesn't really know all of his family members, and the family tree he hands you is blank. So it's up to you to identify his family members and convince them to sign. Curiously, everybody in his family line wears the same type of bracelet, so the actual identification process isn't too difficult, despite them being scattered across the entire known and sometimes even unknown world. But convincing them to sign is another matter altogether. While a good chunk of them will sign simply by talking to them, some of them are a multi-step process, a series of side quests nested in side quests. Filling in the family tree is a lot of back and forth kind of bitch work, but it's worth it at times to visit Kutzman's house as the quest is unfolding and see it filling up with people. And talking to them while they're all here under one roof reveals a lot, especially where many of them maybe didn't realize they were related before. I uh, particularly got a kick out of this one guy's dilemma. This is truly depressing. I didn't know it, but I've been messing around with a relative of mine. Hey, but I can't run from this. I've got to tackle this problem head on. Okay, here's plan A. First, I'll express my love and deny anything happened with an innocent look. Hmm. Now I'll practice plan B just in case. I'm sorry, this is all my fault, though I love you so much. I've made a terrible mistake. Does a simple sorry work better? Right, sorry sounds much more frank. Along with the puppy dog eyes. In a worst case scenario, I'll just opt for plan C. No words, no eye contact. I'll just clam up and not say a word. That bailout plan is used by all the primates. So, yeah, um, I wish I could say I didn't relate to this in some regard, but, um, look, I have a big family and I grew up in a small town. Sometimes you just don't know. I'm gonna let your imaginations fill in the rest, but I know full well it's gonna be far worse than what actually went down. But you guys, uh... You all have fun with that. Otherwise, the only major side quest I want to highlight here is the Star Chart side quest. At various save points, you can travel to this otherworldly church where a priest levels up your characters and your deck size capabilities. But there's a second NPC in this church who watches over this astrological chart in the ceiling, which at the time you first arrive is nearly blank, as the stars above have been sealed into Magnus and scattered throughout the world. This is a lot like the Stardust side quest in The Legend of Dragoon, but you don't have to navigate it 
quite as blindly. Most of the star cards are found as drops from specific enemies or by inspecting things when prompted while exploring. When you get close to the end of the game, if you're having trouble finding the last few cards, you can ask the priest for clues to their location and he's usually quite helpful. Turning these Magnus over to him rewards you periodically with new Magnus, which come in a lot of handy, but also, there's a certain sense of satisfaction in just watching the pictures form as you go. Though this isn't my first playthrough, this is the first time I completed this quest, and I was happy to have seen it through. Now those are the side quests that I've found really use the game's mechanical systems. But towards the end of the game, you hit a point where each of your playable characters gets a new optional side quest of their own that rewards you with their ultimate gear, but more importantly, rewards you with the closure of their character arcs. Though it is optional, I highly recommend you do all of these, unless you really just don't care about the story or characters. It's a pretty long sidestep to the main plot to complete it all, and it's kind of bullshit the character arcs are mostly closed here, but they do by and large provide satisfying conclusions for our main party members that you really shouldn't miss out on. And I mean, how could you even consider missing out on a brilliant exchange like this one? <laughs> give me a break, will ya? <laughs> you give me a break, Gibari. <laughs> <laughs> Getting back to the bits about the game's absurdity and completionist runs, it's probably a good time to mention one of the title's most enduring legacies, the 100% speedrun record. Baton Kaido's Eternal Wings and the Lost Ocean 100% speedrun has long been hailed as one of the longest speedruns in speedrunning history, with the current record clocking in at a whopping 337 hours and 55 minutes. It's worth noting the speedrun also uses a few exploits, but that only makes this legacy all the more shocking. The speedrun times, however, might be a little bit misleading. Now it's true there's a massive content here that can make a 100% speedrun take a long time in general, but it is absurd absurdity and little else that causes this speedrun to be so long. To 100% the game, obviously, you'll need to discover every Magnus. As we've seen earlier with the Warrior's mementos and the 40 hours of real world time required to evolve it, this simply cannot be rushed. But there's a few Magnus even more absurd than that, and one in particular that we owe this entire legacy to. So let's look at the Shampoo Magnus. The Shampoo Magnus can be sold for 15 gil, used in defense mode to give plus 20 to paralysis resistance or attack mode for a 1% chance to cure paralysis. The flavor text for the shampoo card reads as follows. Shampoo, blended with moisturizer for dry damaged hair. Try it for two weeks. Your hair won't be able to thank you enough. It'll be shiny and healthy. So did you catch that? Because if you didn't, you might not want to miss out on that try it for two weeks part. That line is more literal than one might naturally assume. It's more literal than anybody should ever assume because it's frankly very absurd. So if we just punch in some numbers here. Three hundred and thirty six. Ladies and gentlemen, that is three hundred and thirty six hours of real world time. So dumb, it's brilliant. No! It's just dumb! After 336 hours of real world time passes, in game, not in menus, the shampoo Magnus evolves into a splendid hair Magnus, the last Magnus likely anybody will ever find. This Magnus cannot be sold and it has no battle purpose. It just unlocks six tracks in the game's sound test menu. Playing this game normally, no single playthrough would ever reach this level of hours logged. It's only in pursuit of this final Magnus anybody would ever run their file for so long. It is absolutely insane, but damn do I respect that level of pointless absurdity. It's like getting the golden shit in Breath of the Wild for collecting all 900 Koroks. Like, what else do you want? After so much time in the game, what could you even need? And if they gave you something like honestly, truly useful, that's just gonna lead people to complaining about that cool, useful thing being behind such a high wall of accessibility. So yeah, this may have one of the longest 100% speedrun times, but it's a little deceptive. If you excluded this card, I can guarantee that 100% speedrun time legacy simply wouldn't exist.
One thing I absolutely adore about Bat and Kaidos is its approach to world design. We already discussed the Cloud Sea business that would be borrowed later for Xenoblade Chronicles 2, as well as the floating continents. But taking a close look reveals something I find rather spectacular. A strong sense of creativity and a captivating example of using a high fantasy backdrop as fuel for artistic expression courtesy of, among other artists, Yasuyuke Hon. Yasuyuki, who worked on previous Squaresoft titles such as Chrono Trigger, Chrono Cross, and Xenogears, as well as later Monolith Soft titles such as Xenoblade Chronicles. They possess a truly blessed and trained eye for environmental design and a magical touch with the stroke of a brush. While some towns and locations may feel familiar or conventional, Baton Kaidos intermittently offers up locations that can only be placed into a high fantasy universe. Areas like Parnass, the confectionery village, a place made entirely out of confectionery. Or areas like Reverence, the picture book village. Even with areas not this far-fetched, however, there's still a beauty to marvel over, found in the brushstrokes of the artist who painted each layer and frame of the environments. It's the artistry, almost more than anything, that demands a remaster for this game. Even as a Puritan enslaved to my GameCube and its shitty AV cables, I have to admit, I seen how the game looks on emulator and felt in the pit of my stomach regret. Regret that I couldn't have seen its beauty in full effect on its native hardware and through its only official North American release. Botan Kaidos, Botan Kaidos, Botan Kaidos. So once again, as you can see, I spent so long working on this video that it is out of date before I even finished it. Now that we know that there's an HD remaster coming, I suppose I can skip the next rant that I originally had here. So, um, we'll just move on. Otherwise, many of the dungeons in the game run a gambit of aesthetic and mechanical design gimmicks that I'm, for the most part, really happy about. I know it's becoming more and more unpopular, but I miss puzzles in RPG dungeons or dungeons with unique gimmicks. And thankfully, Bat and Kaidos puts emphasis on changing things up and making each dungeon different or unique. And though I enjoy what they've done there for the most part, there are some rare misses. Attacking the low-hanging fruit first, there's a short dungeon area set in a heavy snowstorm. It's really cool when you first go in seeing your characters carve paths through the snow and watching how the snow reacts to your movements. It feels a little bit ahead of its time. It's cool as well seeing how your characters react to the adverse weather conditions, and you can really feel the impact of the wind against them as you fight against it to make progress through the level. At least, it's cool for about 8 seconds. Then that progress feels tedious, slow, trudging, monotonous. And like, I get it, it's a neat idea, and I like it, on paper. But I don't really like it on my screen, or my controller, or on my clock, cause I'm a busy man and I just don't have time for this sort of thing. There's also a super weird dungeon I can see a lot of people hating. It's essentially only a couple screens long, but each screen is fractured like an image in a kaleidoscope, and mixed around without any rhyme or reason. The gimmick here is to try to understand the environment through these mixed up pieces, locate your player character, and navigate them to the end as they jump from one camera image to another. I didn't hate this myself and found I adjusted to the gimmick pretty quick, but it certainly won't be for everybody. The same can be said about a certain dungeon where stretches operate like an NES game in the image of Legend of Zelda or Legacy of the Wizard. I liked it, but some people really won't. Then again, there's certain ideas that not even I can offer a pacifist's benefit of the doubt to. Like this one particular type of boss battle where you draw cards that are face down and randomized, with only certain cards being able to damage the boss. This is 100% RNG and frankly, just awful design. A far cry from the usual boss battles. Then there's things that just kind of get under my skin. I've mentioned in the past, I'm really not a fan of those revisit every area quests right before you're about to end the game. A lot of them feel forced, don't offer the last hurrah excitement they're meant to, and only delay the thing you're actually excited for. Unfortunately, Bat and Kaidos has one of the worst takes on this type of quest I've ever seen. At a certain point, your party is split up, and it's up to you to locate them all again. This means traveling to several old dungeons and locating what's essentially an interdimensional rift, which they refer to as interdimensional cracks, which of course begs the joke interdimensional butt cracks, cause that's how I really feel about them. Actually, I'd like to take that joke back, alright? I've never seen an interdimensional butt crack before, and for all I know, they might be rad as hell. Butts are beautiful after all. That's my creed, 
and I'm gonna stick to it. Once inside the rift, you'll find a riddle that indicates an item you'll need a quest magnus of to progress to where you can fight a boss, rescue your party member, then travel out. Only, of course, you're not likely to have the item you need when you first enter the place. So you travel to a new location, you find the interdimensional crack, you travel into it, you get the riddle, you travel out, you exit the area, you travel to a new location to get the riddle item, possibly not even on the same continent, then travel back, enter the dungeon again, arrive at the riddle spot, turn over the item and hope you got it right, then fight a boss and save your party member. Then you have to do it again and again and again for every party member. If there was a decent fast travel system, this might not be too much of an issue, but there isn't, and it feels like the quest takes forever without adding much conversational substance along the way. It's one giant slog just slammed into the middle of what's otherwise one of the most exciting parts of the adventure. And unfortunately, this is one of quite a few of the game's snags when it comes to pacing. And on that note, I'd argue that's probably the game's biggest sticking flaw. It doesn't always have the best pacing, and I can't help but feel the game might be better suited for a 35 to 40 hour runtime rather than the 50 plus it takes the average person. In saying that, there's only a couple times where the pacing issues really felt like a wear on the patients, and it's never so much of an issue it's worth dropping the game over. But I think it's time we discuss the aforementioned most exciting part of the game that this slog section occurs directly after, because this is one of the coolest things Bat Kaidos does from a narrative perspective. One of those things you always want to see a game do, but most frankly just don't have the stones to pull off. Needless to say, major spoilers lie ahead, and if you don't want to see them, skip to the timecode written on the screen now. Hey, that's not how you play the game. Batten Kaidos plays host to a great number of compelling plot twists, both in relation to the main story and certain character backstories. And though it would please me greatly to explore them all in detail, we simply don't have the time, nor do I have the willpower to edit that much. But I would like to look at one major turning point in the story that takes place about halfway through. As the party travels with Callus seeking vengeance and end Magnus cards, it becomes a recurring issue that the Alfardian Empire is either taking them away or getting to them first. This comes to a head mid-game when it's revealed the enemy has indeed acquired all of the End Magnus, including one Callus had claimed to have lost or dropped. With all the cards in enemy hands, a truth that's been running behind the scenes the entire duration of the game is brought to light. Callus had been in league with the enemy the entire time. It's me. I work together with Melodia. The confectionery village. Melodia stumbled and staggered in front of us. I pretended to help her stand up. I handed her the end magnus. I would advise you all to behave yourselves. Unless you want me to unleash the full might of Malpercio. This secret was cleverly kept from his guardian spirit via the amnesia they were reported to have suffered at the start of the game. All a part of the cover-up that occurred when Callus made a deal with the wicked Melodia. Melodia, who had been pulling the strings on all the bad actors from the very beginning. With the powers of the End Magnus, Melodia can summon to Earth the ancient dead evil of Malpertio, the one who would bring about the end of man as they know it. And what does Callus get out of all of this? Besides a position of power, he gets what he always wanted, a chance to be normal, to no longer be an other. He is granted a new set of real wings. Beautiful white wings for you, for the world, death, and destruction. <laughs> Need this spirit's power? I 
of eternal power! The gods! Unfortunately, there's no place for you in this world. Nobody needs you anymore. Your game is over. Back to your world now. So long. It's fun. This is the beginning of a new era. A holy war shall be upon us. The friendly god of despair. Malbush, the cursed is awakening from its eternal slumber. This is one of those types of plot twists I always wanted to see, but is rarely pulled off, especially with such good execution. The betrayal of knowing your main playable character has been deceiving you all along leaves a lasting sting, especially with the narrative slant we talked about with you being the guardian spirit. And when you arrive at this point and the truth is revealed, not even the funky audio mixing and recording quality can stop those goosebumps from forming and the hair on the back of your neck and arms from standing on edge. It's one of the most powerful and dark, twisted moments I've felt in an RPG and one I'll remember for years. It's also a fantastic example of a character going through a corruption arc. True, Callus was always a bit of a dark and twisted character, but the depths of which were unknown to us until it's revealed how Melodia corrupted him to the dark side, so to speak, by using his greatest insecurities against him. What Callus doesn't realize at the time, though, is just how this deal he made to get what he always wanted will take everything he's ever acquired and didn't realize was what he actually needed. His friends, who are basically at this point his family, his position, and his guardian spirit, who after this becomes bonded to Shella. This is a realization Callus stays blind to, however, as his honeymoon with power keeps him drunk and unaware. Everything in the narrative up to this point was weaved to preserve the impact of this scene, and it really does hit, regardless of all the things that could work to dampen it. For this one scene alone, I'd say Bat and Kaido should be in everybody's play pile rather than their backlog, but there's still so much more worth playing it for and so many more jaw-dropping reveals that change the context of so much you thought you knew and understood. It really is an amazing journey. From this point, there's not too much left that I think we really need to look at. In terms of the soundtrack, Baton Kaidos is serviced well by the compositions of the genre's most prolific composer, Motoi Sakuraba. And while this has some of Motoi's best work in what I would consider his standard style, it also has some tracks that feel indistinguishable from the work he submitted for Tales of the Abyss. In fact, you could easily take some tunes from this game and drop them into Tales of the Abyss and never notice that they weren't actually meant for that game. You know what, in fact, let's take this for the test. I'm gonna play three clips, all Tales of the Abyss clips, and you just go ahead, take a guess. Is this Tales of the Abyss music or Bat and Kaidos music? Alright, so some of you might have seen through me completely. They were all Bat and Kaido songs, but I don't think any of you would deny if you've played Tales of the Abyss that that music sounds just like the Tales of the Abyss soundtrack. There is one thing I've neglected to mention about the game and its reputation that still today might have some people looking at it as though it were a monster with several heads, and that would be a rather infamous English dub. Some of the voice acting is frankly just bad. And unfortunately, where the voice acting isn't bad, there is a noticeably poor quality sound to the recording that even an untrained ear would have no trouble picking up. Words can bring mischief. Confide not in those yet to be proven worthy of trust. I'll keep that in mind. I once heard somebody refer to this game as Tin Can Kaitos, and the nickname makes a lot of sense. What is really unfortunate about this, however, is that the quality of the voice acting is usually diminished in the court of public opinion due to the quality of the recording and not the acting itself. 
A lot of the acting in the game is honestly fine, but many people just cannot hear past the audio quality. I've long been curious what could cause the sound to be this way, but I have no definitive answers. Just spitballing here, I would say the easiest answer is, of course, that the audio was super compressed to fit on the game disc, and the compression techniques they used affected the EQing in a way that everybody sounded like they were in a small glass box. Which would lead into a second theory that all the recording might have been done in a small glass box. Or at least a small room with very little in the way of diffusers and sound absorption. That to me seems the most likely, but if the upcoming remaster keeps the original voice casting, and I hope they do, for all its cuts and bruises, it's charming as hell. Audible sigh. If they had kept it and it sounded the same, then we'd know the compression techniques were not the issue. But alas, it is what it is. I guess the original North American version of Bat and Kaidos won't entirely lose its validity in the wake of the remaster. But I can't see many people choosing the original over the remaster if the only thing missing was some charming, jank voice acting. That, for the record, gives a lot of character to the game. The last idea that I had for what could have caused this jank audio sound is the most unlikely but not impossible, and this would all relate to one character. The great Mizuti, as a character, has a sort of phaser effect on their voice when they talk. I be the great Mizuti. What you be doing here? If this effect was created using the GameCube's internal sound chips and wasn't written into the audio files themselves, then there's a chance that in order to keep load times down while loading audio files, they left the effect on permanently, but dialed the settings for it to zero when anybody besides Mizuti was talking. Now you might think that turning the effect all the way down to zero means it doesn't actually affect the sound, but if my experience with patch bays and pedal boards are anything to go by, an effect dialed to zero can still affect the sound. But loading and unloading a plugin could have been more taxing than just loading or unloading a preset for it. Now that one explanation is extremely unlikely, but it's at least somewhat possible. My understanding of the inner workings of the GameCube and its sound chip frankly aren't good enough to really say with confidence if this is a likely scenario or not. Either way, the sound quality issue is not something I can answer, but it's also not something I could avoid talking about if we're talking about Bat and Kaidos. It kind of sticks out like a sore thumb. For many, the reputation of the voice acting precedes the game itself. But it's nothing to be scared of for those looking to jump in. But if it does scare you, the remaster has reportedly dropped the English cast and will be launching with a Japanese voiceover track. <clears throat> Hello? Hey, you got my message. In conclusion, Bat and Kaido's Eternal Wings and the Lost Ocean, despite a few bruises to its reputation and some pacing issues here and there, is a game with a legacy that deserves a playthrough for all genre fans and earns the remaster it has coming more than most games that get that treatment today. In the hands of industry newbies, new, fun, and interesting ideas were formed, and with the aid of industry veterans, they were realized and brought to life. Though it was sent out to a market that didn't fully get it, and put on a platform that left it to die, those who were in the know kept word of it alive for the last 20 years, using the success of Monolith Soft's Xenoblade series to bring Bat and Kaidos back into the social consciousness. Now, with an HD remaster of both entries on the near horizon, and on a system with unprecedented success, Bat and Kaidos may finally be primed itself for success. And with enough interest, perhaps the once planned Bat and Kaidos 3 will come to fruition, and Monolith Soft can be the proud developers of two ongoing flagship JRPG series. And I think we could all agree that they worked for it and earned it. From their moderate beginnings as a workforce of developers jaded by big companies and their seeming lack of care for the artistry of game making, to today, where they finally get the recognition they always deserved. Monolith Soft has become a name to be trusted, a name that for many inspires confidence and respect. Respect that was made the old-fashioned way, by working for it, earning it, working to impress more and more with everything they do. Bat and Kaidos may have once been seen as a stepping stone for the company, and a step some may even argue was taken awry. But it had then, and still has now, all the potential to be the gilded walkway that takes Monolith Soft from where they are now to where they need to go next. And if their trajectory is anything to go by, on the wings of the heart, they're only going to go up. Wow. Even for this channel, that's a pretty cheesy outro. Anyway, if you're tired of Tarx's videos and you're looking for something significantly lower quality, then be sure to check me out at Craftium.
Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the end of the video. While I'm super stoked we have HD remasters of Bat and Kaidos 1 and 2 coming to the Switch, I have to say it comes at a really bittersweet time for me. I finished my playthrough of this game in July of 2022. I started my playthrough in May of that year. After July, I started working on the script, and by November, I started working on the edit for this video. Now, I'm not somebody who has a lot of free time in my day-to-day -day life, so I've actually been working on this edit since then. It's been four months in the making. So it's with a little bit of bitterness that just a couple months after this video comes out, it's gonna look pretty dated to some people with its crunchy 480p GameCube graphics, and everybody else is gonna have this nice, shiny new video. Like Bat and Kaidos itself, I might be releasing this to a market that could just leave it to die. But I will concede that is a risk I know I take when revisiting these old RPGs that I love and taking my time with them. As much as I would love to get the job done quicker, there's really just nothing I can do about it right now. Between some big upcoming life changes, full-time work, a sickness that kept me out of actual like recording voice lines for a month in December, this was honestly all I could muster four months for a video that's just over an hour. And in saying all this, I will also admit I kind of rushed the end of the editing a little bit just to get it out before the remaster completely destroys any of the views I might actually be able to get on this video. I guess it's also possible that anything else I might have liked to add may have just been minutia. Anyway, I would hate to close this video just by complaining, woe is me, you know, all this misery and whatnot. So for all of you who made it this far, a huge thank you is in order. If you like what you see, share it with a friend. I know the video won't look as shiny soon, but I do hope the information and the perspective I provide gives the video some relevance after the HD remaster comes out. And if you think that it does, by all means, go to social media, go anywhere, scream it from the top of a mountain, share the video. I am the worst person when it comes to advertising my own work, so that's where you guys come in. I have a feeling this video will need all the help it can get. So for all of you willing to try, I applaud you and thank you for your effort. So for now, we say goodbye and good night. And I surrender this video to the eternal wings of the internet and the lost ocean of YouTube content. As always, folks, thanks for watching. Actually, there is one more thing that I wanted to add to this video. I didn't have a spot that I thought it really fit in the main crux of the video, but uh, when they announced that this game was coming to North America, the original version, not the HD remaster, the preview they used was like a dubbed version of the intro video, which is not the same dubbed version that appears in the game. They actually dubbed this intro video twice and the first one the one for the announcement trailer is like really wonky we're just gonna go ahead and use that for the end screen here so enjoy some more last minute wonky bat and kaidos pronunciations the god of demise and destruction the cursed power of mar petro the end of magnus never heard of that before great heroes are just so busy from when did you know Keep no dead weight! No way! <laughs> the lost ocean. Awaken! God of the past! <laughs> now! Be what you want to be! Someday you will know what you are meant to be.